Thank you, everyone. I'm Joshua Harker. I'm an artist, and I use 3D printing technology and uh, softwares as my medium. Um, I've been considered a revolutionist and a pioneer in that aspect. And um, I've always approached uh, uh, many of the things I've done from the outside in. So this was definitely uh, how this journey for me progressed. I'm going to take you through this arc of the 3D printing, this third industrial revolution using my art. Uh, my art was proactive, or proactionary, if that's the word, um, meaning it came first. And I was always trying to figure out a way to develop uh, my pieces uh, sculpturally. I was drawing these things, and they couldn't be made any other way. I tried all kinds of traditional mediums. Uh, so watching this technology tick along, um, I was able to you know, again, chronicle the development of this because as one thing happened, I would inch a little closer to being able to realize uh, my visions and I was always watching it, working with it very, very closely. Um, so, in 1986, the email, or the internet mail access protocol was uh, uh, invented and email started changing the way uh, that we communicate. In that same year, uh, stereolithography uh, 3D printing technology was patented. And about that time, I started doing these drawings uh, I call them tangles, and these were an exploration of what I call the uh, architecture of the imagination. I was really trying to see the unseen and understand this, this um, notion of creativity and understand what it means and, and really dig into that. Uh, and the drawings got more and more complex and more sophisticated. And uh, it turns out, I, I, I did some research trying to figure out maybe where I fit in, what the genre was that I was working in. You know, a lot of people are trying to figure out where I belonged and you know how to label it um, and it turns out that this was uh, an exercise called automatism uh, pioneered uh, by the surrealist movement uh, by uh, and used by people like Masson and Breton, Arp, Dali, even Picasso and uh, you know it's just this very loose spontaneous approach to to channeling um, you know an idea kind of a Ouija board approach I suppose to uh, um, to making art to see what happened put out an, an honest mark without consciously getting in the way. And uh, so I, I felt I was on the right track. I didn't invent it, but you know, after finding out some, uh, some important people had used it, uh, that was important to me. And, and people loved them. Uh, you know, they started putting them on their skin and, and, uh, and were very interested in them. Again, I wanted to move into three dimensions, and um, I, you just can't do it. It's just too complex and, and the, for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, not just the intricacy and the complexity of the piece, uh, but there's variations in geometry within it and, uh, and later symmetry. Um, this is a piece, a stone piece, an attempt at it. I made a lot of attempts, you know, clay and wood and wax and, and putties and wire and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I would get variable results, uh, but none of them had that, uh, that spontaneity and, and the intricacy that I was looking, uh, looking for. So I uh, kept the flame alive uh, for my tangles, and I moved on to my other love, which is uh, the figure. And I did a lot of figure drawings, and, uh, and I did more, and I did figure sculpture, and I did more, and I started taking off uh, the arms and the legs and the heads and, and things. And out of those sprouted, uh, you know, the tangles again. They, they just kept coming back, and they came back in other things. They came back in horns and teeth and tails. Um, you know, but again, these were kind of simple versions of what I was really going for. So to pay the bills along the way, uh, in uh, uh, the early 90s, I had started working um, in the product development industry as a commercial sculpture, sculptor, uh, doing, uh, you know, action figures and Happy Meal toys and collectibles and things of this nature. And in 98, I opened um, my own boutique uh, design and development studio and uh, on an investment of $2,000. And in, within a couple of years, we were approaching $2 million in revenue. And this is facilitated by this 3D printing equipment and all this associated technology. We had two very, very high-end uh, printers, um, vacuum pressure casting vessels, machine shop, you know, the whole thing. And, and, uh, and, and we did everything. I, mean, you know, we were, I was doing a lot of sculpture still, but we started you know, doing a lot of this prototype work with uh, motorcycles and medical equipment and you know, telecommunications. And, you name it, you name it, we were touching on it. At that time, um, I started, you know, because of all this more geometric kind of stuff and prototyping, um, I was asked and, and then brought in much earlier in the projects to help uh, problem solve and troubleshoot the, um, the projects. And it became necessary that I learn CAD. Uh, and I started doing that. 
and I started designing more and more things. And um, these like scoreboards, I designed all the pixel housings. There are all these snap-in fit features and, and locks and stuff. Uh, so my work got a lot more geometric than anything I'd ever done before. Um, and then it got more and more mechanical. Uh, gears and clutches and locking and you know, pieces and uh, tumblers and you know, little electronic pieces and stuff incorporated into it. Uh, this is a Gauss engine, uh, basically a magnetic accelerator I designed. And again, just all these triggers and timing and all this stuff. And it's just completely outside of what I, I had originally ever done or thought about as an artist. Um, which is good, this engineering aspect was really capturing my imagination and changing the way I, I thought about forms and what, you know, just what a shape could do. And I always liken that to Archimedes and the screw, the design, you know, the, the shape that has such a, a profound function, um, you know, just the shape of that. So, you know, starting to understand, you know, engineering, like mechanical engineering, all that stuff. I started working with um, animation uh, programs. Uh, in that allowed me to manipulate meshes and, and work much more organically, get back to the sculptural aspect of it, you know, rather than the, the engineering part of it. And I uh, established a pipeline to, to uh, bring that uh, software, to, to export it, so to speak, into a format that I could 3D print. And I started incorporating this a lot more into, you know, basically the services at my company um, and what we could do and, and really, uh, you know, putting that together. Now, the geometric stuff we could always do. We, you know, you, you CAD it up and you print it out and we make our prototypes. But the organic stuff, this was new, you know, to be able to work within that virtual world and, and then, you know, take that into, uh, you know, just print those right out was, was new. So I was very excited. And from there, I started developing with the tool set uh, within one of the programs, um, my first virtual tangle. Um, and I was very excited about this. You know, I had uh, something I could work with where I could, you know, realize these three-dimensional. Even if it didn't exist, it was still three-dimensional. You know, I was, I was going down that road again. As these things would tick along, I just, uh, let me try this, let me try this. And it wasn't, you know, just one technology or one software. It was like juggling all these things and trying to get it all in the air at the same time. So this is a render of my first tangle. This is called Permutation Prime. And uh, this is the very first print. I did this on a, uh, a polyjet printer. And I was, you know, I was doing backflips. This is great news for me, you know? And it was really exciting, but at the same time, the material had some limitation. It would collapse under its own weight. Um, you know, it, it held form, but it, it still would kind of, was kind of malleable. And in the process, used like this gel support material like, during the growth process. Uh, that was very hard to get out of the inside of this thing. But, but I did it, so you know, I, I was very, very pleased. Um, so I switched technologies. I went to this technology called SLS, which stands for Selective Laser Sintering, which is essentially a, a nylon and glass powder that's fused together with a laser. And it's in this uh, powder nest. The, this nest of powder basically supports the, the piece as it's being grown. So I don't have anything to remove. When it's done, it, that, that can all be blown away in, in the um, uh, the model liberated, and so that was very direct and very much what I wanted. It, it held its own shape. Uh, it was in a, a much more uh, permanent uh, material, but that still wasn't enough. I, I would, it was a little bit novel to me yet, for just because of um, the fact that they were plastic, and I really felt this connection that uh, to the past in wanting to to bridge this, the traditional approach to sculpture, at least the uh, traditional mediums with all this new technology and kind of, it just helped get my head around that, you know, this was all part of the same uh, progression. And um, I started working with a, uh, well, here's a bunch more I did in, in, uh, in color versions, but I started working with a, uh, a company in Germany that worked in a powder bed um, uh, process, but their material would burn out in, uh, in uh, it would incinerate in their furnace. And they gave me a lot of R&D work and support and faith, and we made uh, the very first, uh, a tangle in bronze, in cast bronze. Now this is a big deal. This is the first time anything of this organic complexity uh, could ever be made, or ever had been made. And again, this wasn't just the 3D printers. It wasn't just my vision of these tangles. Uh, it, and it wasn't just the software it, it, or just the material engineer. It was everything. It all had to happen at the same time. And again, watching this stuff and, and, and nailing it and, and you know, uh, Finding a place to, you know, that was able to handle certain responsibilities in the process was all key in this. Uh, so the, this threshold, um, this design and uh, manufacturing possibility threshold, 
I, I had stepped through it. And it, that's huge it, and profound to me in the sense that this was a, a flag in the dirt that it had happened. Now, you know, practically, what do you use these for besides sculpture? But they stand for something, that, that new things can now be made that could never be made before. And, and, and that's, you know, it, it's happening so fast, we can hardly even predict what's going to happen in the next few years. You know, it's like things are just coming out from everywhere and, and, and changing so dramatically fast in, in, amazingly, uh, in amazing ways. Um, and this is Permutation Prime in bronze. I had, uh, yeah, I wanted to tell the world about this. You know, I, I, I could read the headlines, you know, most uh, complex, technically organic, uh, you know, form ever made by man, ever, 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 you know, everybody, let's, uh, hooray. Well, you know, crickets. It, it wasn't quite uh, received that way. There was no context for it. And it, people didn't quite understand what was going on. The, the industry folks were very, very supportive of, uh, of my work. Uh, and appreciated the, um, the technical aspect of it and how it was done, but they didn't understand the art uh, or, or why it really mattered. And then the art folks were, uh, you know, they, they liked, you know, what I was doing conceptually, but didn't understand the technology. It's like, oh, the computer did it for you, and I, I don't understand the medium. You know, it, it, they didn't know how to sell it, they didn't know how to understand it or how it fit in uh, to the process. So context was key. So. Uh, you know, I figured I'd just keep plugging along and, and, and work on that context. So, in the meantime, I went back to uh, my other love of the figure, and in particular, uh, I did a bunch of uh, forensic uh, uh, training in, in anatomy studies and started doing facial reconstructions. And I, I figured, you know, if, if dead bodies were good enough for da Vinci, I should probably pay a little attention to it as well. And uh, so I, I was doing these, and then I, I quickly developed a, a way to digitally approach these. and, and uh, and use all these digital tools I've been using with, with my other, uh, uh, you know, endeavors, and applied it to this. And I started doing uh, reconstructions of mummies uh, from CT scans from museums. Um, so all of these are like 3,000-year-old uh, Egyptian mummies with faces on them, and, and you know that was really cool. But to say the least, I was looking at a lot of skulls. I was just I've really seen a lot of skulls. So with this frustration, with uh, you know how. Uh, the medium was being accepted in, in trying to educate the public about it and, and the arts communities and so on. Um, uh, again, you know, working from the outside in, I, I wasn't working within that gallery system, the exhibition uh, networks, and it was very frustrating, and I was spinning my wheels. And I, I made this piece, uh, Crania Anatomica Filigre, and it, it, symbol, it was a skull to symbolize the, the end of, of this commitment to this traditional aspect of, of, of disseminating art in, in my work and trying to get it out there. And then this filigree pattern is this creative exploration, a symbol of that, of, of how to reach new people in new ways and through new networks. So this thing, uh, Kickstarter, anybody heard of Kickstarter? Anybody out there? Yeah, it, it flipped on my radar um, and it's like, this is cool, right? Uh, this is something I should try. Uh, so I, I put up a project and um, this is the piece, I had printed it out, here's, a, here's a, you know, a larger version of it. And I put it up on Kickstarter and it became, uh, and still is, the, the most funded sculpture project they've ever had. Uh, so it was a big deal and, you know, and then just the notoriety and the, 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 the press and attention that came from that really brought a, a lot more context for other things I was doing. Um, and Kickstarter uh, was great. Uh, and, and people loved it, you know. They're just, I'm selling them like crazy, you know. Again, the tattoos, they come out, you know. You know, some, you're on something that people start putting it on themselves. Um, I was doing limited editions, uh, versions of them, special editions of them, all kinds of other projects and tangents of them and collaborations with other artists. It's still in, I mean, this is all very kind of current stuff. And uh, I did another project uh, just recently, Anatomica de Revolutis. This is in honor of the Third Industrial Revolution. And this Third Industrial Revolution is everything that I kind of been talking about. It's not just 3D printing. It's, it's the networks. It's, you know, the Kickstarters, the social networks, you know, Facebook, and all these other things that we use to communicate and share and show uh, our work. An interesting uh, uh, thing that happened on my first project, uh, one of the founders of Etsy uh, backed my project and got a hold of me and, and said I should, you know, consider Etsy. And I, I don't, you know, mean any uh, insult or anything, but I thought it was popsicle sticks and yarn and stuff. And I, I looked into it, and it is absolutely not the case. There's a lot of really great things on there. And um, they had written a blog post on me, and then Tumblr, somebody picked that up, and one of the images off this post is upwards of like 90,000 notes now. And that's, to get that kind of uh, 
visibility, you know, in a gallery or something. It's just, it doesn't happen. Now, that obviously, all these people aren't, you know, they're casual wanderers of the internet. They're not all art buyers. But that recognition, that, re you know, that uh, being recognized and, and having that out there and it becoming part of the public psyche it was, is a very, very big thing. And, and, you know, this whole network and revolution of all this stuff that's happening is, is huge in that. Well, so I, made, I did this project. And it incorporated uh, three different pieces. There's the skull. It's a new design, Crania Revolutus, and that de uh, was uh, defining the uh, kind of the end of an era and the growth, uh, regrowth over the ghost of the past. Uh, and then there's these wings, uh, Phoenix Revolutus, and it, it's signifying the um, uh, rebirth of uh, the phoenix from the ashes. And my tangle aesthetic is back in there, symbolizing the fire. These wings are made from 75, over 75 separate moving pieces, and they're all printed at one time in one assembly. So it comes off the printer, and, and it's and they're ready to go. Uh, very cool. This is the crooked Karen symbolizing the institution, and, and there's uh, you know, a bunch of other metaphor within that. It hangs off there's the pull on it. So the entire uh, piece um, assembled uh, you know, symbolizes uh, liberty and prosperity through a participatory uh, populace. Um, now, this is, is just the whole thing, again, this whole third industrial revolution was just uh, such a profound uh, thing to me that I felt, uh, uh, you know, it necessary to do this project and, and to speak of the bigger things that were going on with it, the, the way it's touching architecture and medical uh, applications and, um, you know, the art certainly design and manufacturing, it's just changing everything. So. Um, you know, this revolution is building, and uh, I was in the right place waiting for my, my wave to roll in, and I was, I was ready. And I suggest uh, you all get ready, too. It's, uh, it's a big one that's coming in. Thank you. Join the revolution.